Nick Matlin, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome you. Thank you, Madam Chairpersons. And um, thank you very much to Amelia and Rita, the whole EBART team, for inviting us all to this wonderful meeting. I've really enjoyed this morning very much, as I'm sure you have. And it's also been a huge relief to come to Barcelona and see that spring is going to happen in 2018. But there are still some clouds I've, got, I've been asked to discuss today. Um, so I've got this rather challenging title, Managing Implantation When Desperation Clouds Reason. It's not the most upbeat of titles, but something that I think we do need to address. These are my disclosures. And I suppose we always start a talk like this with a figure that reminds us that this is the rate-limiting step in IVF treatment now. Um, in most centers, we are able to produce eggs. We're able to fertilize eggs, even with IVF. We're able to produce good quality embryos, but the damn things won't stick. That's the problem. And it is very frustrating for us and for our patients. And it is a very basic human reaction, which is why I think a baby shows us exactly what we're feeling in a very clear way. It's very frustrating. And I think I need to start by saying that, you know, it is a frustrating situation, and therefore I'm not here to criticize all colleagues that try things to try and improve it, because we, that's our natural role as doctors. The question is whether we're going about it the right way. Because at the moment, I think we are indeed being driven largely by desperation. As Shakespeare quoted, desperate times do breed desperate measures. And if I was to translate that into something a little bit more clinical, it would be to summarize our current approach to managing implantation failure in this way. That desperation is essentially driving us to try anything. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised when it doesn't work. And this is the challenge, and I think, where we are at the moment. So it is a challenging situation. But we are expected to do something about it. When we come into the room to see the patient who has been suffering from unsuccessful IVF treatments. We're dressed there with our white coat occasionally. We've got a clipboard. We've got a computer in front of us. And we hopefully have an air of authority and clinical expertise, which the patient will invest emotionally and even financially in. But how are we managing this situation at the moment? Not very well. Because we think we know what's wrong. And we develop belief systems that support our approach. And many of us would probably admit that at the back of our minds of many of us is this idea that it's the woman rejecting the embryo and that that's where it's going wrong. It's essentially, it's her fault. She's killing the embryo with her immune system. Now, it's a rather flippant way to express this. But essentially, I think this sentence lies behind much of clinical practice in implantation failure today. And we need to acknowledge it. We also need to understand why it is so. And there are good reasons for it, apart from the fact that we don't really have anything else at the present that seems to work. There is a plausible mechanism there that we've been taught over the years. Very, very strong paradigms around about this balance between acceptance and rejection of the embryo by the mother and the description of very complex and sophisticated immune processes which are designed to allow the, the embryo to implant and, and stop it from implanting inappropriately. But as doctors, of course, it also has a further appeal because it appoints to a very clear treatment option. In other words, let's modulate the immune system. And so we get out the steroids. And if we look in the literature on glucocorticoids, the rationale for their use is on the face of it very appealing. Our colleagues in basic science will tell us there is a whole cytokine network there and maybe an excess of NK cell activity that's implicated in implantation failure. That immunomodulators can reduce the NK cell count, so let's give them. And perhaps more interestingly, glutocorticoid receptors are expressed themselves in the endometrium and the NK cells. Now, the next talk is going to look at this area in more detail. But I think it would be fair to say that for many of us, this is where our current understanding of the field lies and what drives our treatment. But some of us will go beyond that and say, well, if steroids don't work, let's get out the heavy weapons, 
and try intralipid, let's try anti-TNF, let's try IgG. And we'll all have different reasons for using these. And many of us are driven to use them by our patients coming into our clinic clutching this sort of newspaper, turning and saying, doctor, look, this clinic, they gave me intralipid, I finally got my baby. You should, if not, I'm going to go down the road and you're going to have to close your clinic because you won't make any money. And that, again, is the reality that we face in many cases. So we have to recognize that this is potentially a very damaging situation and gets us into a number of problems. From the patient's point of view, they are very open to exploitation. And you'll have heard many talks on this very topic over the last few years, something we've become more aware of. This is just one patient's bill from one IVF cycle somewhere in London a few years ago. And what you see is that there is no lack of enthusiasm for testing. You could almost say it is uh, excessive. In fact, I'm sure you can. But what you can also see is excessive is the bill that the patient is being presented with. And again, it's very human for the patient, as we've heard previous speakers to say, when they've come and invested, say, five or six thousand pounds in an IVF cycle, and the doctor says, well, if you try this, it might just help a little bit. It quickly adds up, just like when you're buying uh, that, that car that um, we heard about. So let's remember that there are, there are victims from this, and our patients are among them. And therefore, it's up to us to stand back and reassess what we're doing. As doctors, we have to recognize that the evidence base for the immune paradigm for treating implantation failure is not strong. This is a recent review uh, from our group uh, in, in Copenhagen, published last year. Again, I don't think that the conclusions will be of any surprise to you, but in fact, the evidence base for us using these routinely in our patients is not there. I would say that this, the conclusion of this slide maybe hides something a bit more sophisticated, and we'll come back to that later on, but this is essentially the clinical situation based on the evidence. So let's take it on board and recognize that there is a cloud of desperation and that it is doing our patients harm and it's doing us harm and it's doing our field harm. And it starts up there in the top right corner with what we have to admit is a poor knowledge of the cause of implantation failure. We have to admit that. We also have to acknowledge that our patients are demanding something from us and that many of us work in commercial environments where we can't just adopt an, an ivory, ivy tower position and just say, well, if there's not a randomized controlled study confirming it works, I won't prescribe it. That's a, a difficult position to sustain for many people working here. So that patient demand is something we do feel. But because we don't understand what's going wrong, and because we don't have any proven effective treatments, we are then drawn to using empirical therapies. And occasionally, they might work. Regression to the mean is a wonderful statistical help for us doctors in all aspects of our practice. It turns poor responders into good responders, and we can take the credit. It turns non-implantations into plantations, and we can take the credit. So sometimes empirical treatments seem to work. And of course, that drives the patient. It drives uh, social media discussion as we've heard in the previous talks. But it does generate then patient belief that this is something effective and opens them to exploitation as we've already discussed. So where do we go from there? Well, we try and do some studies to show them, but as I'm going to show later on, the way we, I think, approach these studies is in a sense designed to fail because the studies out there are not showing any effect. And therefore, we are viewed from outside the IVF world as a rather dodgy branch of medicine, one that is taking money from patients for the use of treatments that don't work when we know they won't um, and that we're excessively exploiting them. They don't want to fund us. Trying to compete with cardiologists and cancer patients when we come from this perceived world is, is quite difficult. And therefore, we've, we struggle to get funding and our level of knowledge remains poor. So it's a rather depressing view of it, and I hope in the next 20 minutes or so I can show you that I think we can step out of this, the circle of desperation. So how can we remove the clouds, he said, with another desperate attempt to try and work the title of the lecture into the slides. How can we remove these clouds of desperation? Well, I want to put to you six suggestions for this, six steps to reason, and I'm going to take each one of them 
one by one. The first is I think we need to acknowledge our misunderstandings of the immune paradigm. That's a great start. We then need to understand what human implantation is for, that is essentially designed to fail, which sounds a rather odd statement, but I'll expand on that, because that will manage our expectation in us and in our patients. We need to under understand what the term recurrent implantation failure means for us and for our patients. We need to understand that the endometrium is far more than just a receptive passive organ, allowing an embryo to invade. We need to learn to diagnose these functions of the endometrium, because only then can we target interventions and test targeted interventions in the context of precision medicine. So let us start with this one. Ashley Moffat, many of you will know, is one of the leading scientists who actually coined the term natural killer cell a number of years ago when she was working in Cambridge. And whenever I bump into her at this type of meeting, she will always say how much she regrets having used that term because it certainly implies a negative function in the role of implantation. And I think she wrote this very nice paper in Human Reproduction a couple of years ago just telling us not to go overboard with this. First, do no harm. We need NK cells in implantation. Again, we're going to be hearing more about that uh, uh, after this lecture. Uterine NK cells are not killer cells. They have a completely different function. They're, they have a key role in decidualization and placentation. Without NK cells, you won't get a pregnancy. And therefore, the myth that you need to suppress them to prevent embryo damage is wrong. This idea that NK cells are by definition bad. And of course, the, the, the authors of this paper draw a similar conclusion as many have when they look at our field, as it appears that we just adopt things on a whim without uh, waiting for studies to show for whom it will work and if it works at all. The other paper I would draw your attention to is from Adelaide Group, it published a couple of years ago, which I think made a very, very simple statement that the corticoid steroid therapy that many of us use after a patient has failed implantation once or twice is a faulty premise. And the basis of their argument is that there will be some women, if we believe in the immune paradigm, where the problem is insufficient immune response, in other words, a, a, a low inflammation state, insufficient for implantation, and others where, yes, it might be too high. And therefore, if we give everyone steroids, there may be just as many people who suffer negative effects from that treatment as those who might suffer positive. And when Caroline Bolso and I did a, a Cochrane analysis on glucocorticoids a number of years ago and updated it, essentially we could find no benefit from glucocorticoids. And of course this may be the explanation, that as many people suffer from it as might benefit from it. And that raises the challenge that we'll come back to later on. The second point we need to understand is What's going on in human implantation? We've heard this morning the opening lecture about the very high rate of chromosomal abnormalities in human embryos. And of course, if they were all to implant, we would get a whole load of abnormal masses as the, rather than babies. So we need to have a system that protects the mother from the presence of an abnormal but potentially invasive embryo. And this old slide, I still think, summarizes the situation in spontaneous pregnancies. And the reason I put it up there in the context of an IVF lecture is that if you look at these rates of pre-implantation loss, they are the sort of levels that we get worried about in our IVF clinic. But this is what's going on in nature. This is nature's way of preventing a high rate of babies being born or even a high rate of clinical miscarriages occurring because these losses will take place in the pre-clinical phase. So this is proof that the mother is dealing with this attack of adnuploid, potentially invasive embryos, which occur day three, day four, in the pre-implantation phase, but of course which we see at the time of delivery as being largely dealt with. And what we've been learning over the last few years and work that I've been doing with Jan Brosens in Warwick and, and others, is that the, 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 end, the uterine endometrium is capable of acting as a biosensor and will engage with a good embryo and will actively disengage from a bad one. And this is just one uh, slide from one of my PhD students, uh, Lotte Weimar, um, that we published a few years ago, just showing how these cells will migrate, the stromal cells in an in vitro model will migrate, even when there's no embryo there, when there's a good embryo there, but when you put an abnormal embryo, the cells seem to recognize there's an abnormal embryo there. 
and will not engage with that embryo. And there's been a number of studies now that have supported this concept of the biosensor function of the endometrium. And it's something that is vital that it's there. Because if it's not there, you'll get all sorts of inappropriate implantations taking place, resulting at best in a high rate of clinical miscarriage, and at worst in the birth of babies with abnormalities. So let's remember that just improving implantation is potentially a double-edged sword, and that if we intervene, we may be causing more problems than we're solving. And it may be that this balance between where receptivity and selectivity goes wrong in some patients, so that if they're too selective, they won't allow even good embryos to implant, and if they're not selective enough, they'll allow poor embryos to implant. And I think this is an area that merits more investigation from the point of view of possible clinical interventions. But you'll see that receptivity is only part of the story, and this is something we need to recognize. Any talk about implantation will land at some stage on this concept of recurrent implantation failure. And I'm not going to tell you, get into discussion of what that is today in terms of defining it. But we kind of know what it is when we see it. The patient who's come in had lots of embryos transferred, apparently good quality, everything seemed fine, no pregnancy. And the whole industry is built, built, built up around treating recurrent implantation failure. But when you actually look at the prognosis in women who have this diagnosis, actually it's not bad. And the question raises, is, should be raised is whether or not recurrent implantation failure in its current definition is justified. We looked at this in a, in a study in the Netherlands a few years ago, where we just followed up women who'd had this diagnosis in Amsterdam and Utrecht to see what happened to them. And actually, almost 50% of them got their baby. They had to wait, but they got there in the end. So in many women in whom we are making this diagnosis, actually, there could be a, quite a good prognosis present. And we may be creating something for a medical or clinical need that really doesn't help the patient too much. We've touched on some of the emerging aspects of the endometrium, and, I, and I'm very keen that we move away from this concept of seeing the endometrium as essentially receptive or non-receptive. It's one of the reasons why we're still struggling in this field, is that we've focused only on that element of endometrial function. Sure, that is a key function, and we understand quite a lot about that. But what we're now understanding is the endometrium has many, many other roles that will determine whether or not implantation will be successful. And we've got to go and find out what those are and then hopefully modulate them. So let's just look at a few. If you think about it very simply, when you put an embryo into the uterus, you're basically putting it into some culture medium in an incubator, which our embryo, embryo colleagues, embryologist colleagues do every day. And they stay awake at night worrying about whether the culture medium is perfect, uh, whether the temperature is right. Is the, is the CO2 all right? And we just put the embryo back into the uterus and think, right, well, good luck. And what we're now learning is, by fairly simple investigations, that if you go and analyze the culture medium into which we place the embryo, very simple things can change it. This is a study we did with Francesca Horton in Southampton a couple of years ago, where we looked at endometrial secretions and just measured a range of amino acids, the sort of amino acids that are present in culture media. And we found a profile of this culture media. And what was interesting was to find that the diet of the woman was having a measurable effect on the concentrations of these amino acids in endometrial secretions. Something as simple as that. And yet it's something we completely ignore. We worry about what's in the culture medium in, in the lab, and yet this woman could be ruining hers by who knows what, having a dodgy meal three or four days beforehand. So let's remember this function and see if we can actually optimize the culture media inside the uterus. The other thing we're beginning to understand is that the endometrium communicates with the embryo not just in means of growth factors and cytokines, but by using RNA. And this, is, I think, is quite a profound finding from Carlos Simon's group published in development a couple of years ago. You may have seen it. It, it was the sort of story that did reach the media at the time. And essentially, what they showed in a mouse model was endometrial secretions from a woman, from the human, contain these little exosomes, little packages of RNA. And that these are released into the endometrial cavity. And in an in vitro model using mouse embryos, they were able to demonstrate that these little packets of RNA released by the mother are taken up by the embryo. 
Not only are they taken up, but they actually affect transcription of genes inside that embryo. Now, this work has still got to be confirmed in the human, but the message is clear that if we we've got not just get, get the culture medium right, but if the RNA content is not optimal, we may be having direct effects on programming of the embryo. So let's look at this more closely, too. And I mentioned this idea of the incubator, the embryo incubator, and shown you some very expensive um, uh, incubators and monitoring systems that we all invest in, in our labs, and yet none of us really know how the uterus is functioning as an incubator when we put the embryo back. And particularly if we're doing day two transfers, that is going to be important. We've been looking at the literature in this area, and there does seem to be a bit of a paucity of understanding of these very basic biophysical parameters in the reproductive tract. But they do seem to change. They seem to be susceptible to external influences. Um, we know they, some of them change through the reproductive tract. They may change by day. And they may change by smoking, exercise, who knows what. And yet, at the moment, we don't have a handle on that. So let's, let's get a handle on it. And that's why we've been working with a group of engineers to develop a device that can sit in the uterus and measure these things. Still in early stages, but the technology is now there to do it. And our clinical initial uh, studies um, seem to show that the concept works. If you put such a device into a, ra a, a rabbit uterus, you can demonstrate changes in the temperature inside the uterus through the day, which are quite profound, quite marked, which our incubators, of course, don't do, but maybe they should be doing to mimic the in vivo situation. We can learn about that. And if we look in women with our first proof of concept uh, studies, we see the same pattern. It's difficult engineering, getting all these sensors on there, batteryless device, but the progress is being made. And this may give us new insights into the uterus and how it's functioning. So if we draw those together, we can recognize that we have the tools now to look much more critically at the endometrium in its function in implantation. And we can do better than this. This is our current diagnostic toolbox for endometrial function in most cases. And it doesn't really work. This is an ROC curve showing the sensitivity, specificity of endometrial thickness for predicting uh, clinical pregnancies from the Dutch group recently. But it's all we have, and we're confronted with it every day when we go and scan those follicles. We do look at the endometrium because it's there, we can measure it, and we can get worried about it, and we do. But it's not telling us very much. It really isn't. So now we're moving into, I think, a more sophisticated time where we begin to see the commercial appearance of endometrial gene tests for receptivity. Our own group has been developing less invasive approaches looking at markers in endometrial secretions that will predict implantation as receptivity. And those uh, technologies are coming together now and I think offer the future some more objective means of assessing the quality of that culture medium into which we're putting our embryos. But again, we, as I said before, it's not just about receptivity. And where we need to go now is to properly diagnose the endometrium in all its facets and functions and not just focus on are the right genes being expressed on the right day of the cycle. Sure, that's important and might be key in some women, but it's likely that in the majority of women there's something else that's a problem, so let's go after it. And I've just made a selection here of the sort of things we can look at. Yes, I think immune cells do have a role. We do need to look at those. Signaling factors, decidual markers are becoming clear now. The nutrient story is open for exploration. Hopefully we'll learn about the incubator function Microbiome, very hot at the moment, although whether that's an independent marker of uterine function or just a marker of some other aspect of uterine function is still to be clarified. The exosome story and, of course, the genes. And from that, we can hopefully sit with the patient and say, look, we've had a look. In many cases, your endometrium will be fine. It is the embryo. Or in some cases, we might be able to identify something which will say, well, look, given that this is the problem, let's try this treatment or let's randomize you to a treatment that will treat that problem. And this brings this concept of the implantation clinic. And this is something that we've set up in Copenhagen over the last couple of years to try and encourage women in these difficult situations to go and see, come and see us, um, 
what we'll essentially try to do is determine the endometrial phenotypes of recurrent implantation failure. This is a PhD uh, project of Melena Lir, who's here in the audience. And then to follow up and to see what the prognosis is for these different phenotypic abnormalities and what treatments we might want to test for each of these. Clinically, actually, it already has, although we've just started this, it's very clear that it has some advantages in the clinic. These patients are difficult. When you've been looking after them for three or four cycles, they come into the room with some emotional baggage, and they, there's definitely a sort of a blame going on. You know, you've got to make it work this time, doctor, or else. If you say, look, I'm going to send you to the implantation clinic, it can kind of take the heat out of the situation. Just let someone else go and have a look. They're quite pleased. They're being taken seriously. Someone's going to have a look. The patient's glad to be referred. At the moment, I can't say it's going to improve outcomes, but that's something that will have to be tested in the future. And where this work will take us then is to understand and diagnose the endometrium. We might be able to fill this still rather odd gap whenever we talk to our medical students about the causes of infertility. That a large part of it is unexplained, and we always feel a bit shifty about that and slightly embarrassed. Because the implication from that is that we're not very good doctors. We can't work out what's going wrong. And it may well be that in many cases it's just chance, of course. But it could be that we just haven't been able to diagnose one of the key players in this whole system, and that has been the endometrium. So if we can diagnose the endometrium, maybe this part of the pie chart will get smaller in coming years. And the, first, the last point I would like to make is this importance of target, targeting intervention studies on, based on precision medicine. And I want to make this statement to sort of back up that argument. The first, and, and it's this problem we have with this term recurrent implantation failure and recurrent miscarriage. That we tend to, we've built them into medical diagnoses. We announce to the patient that this is what they have. They meet the criteria for a diagnosis of. Fine. But that's a diagnosis of a clinical experience. It's not a medical condition. There's numerous causes for both of these. And part of our problem is that we've taken, I think recurrent miscarriage is a particular example of this. We've taken it as a clinical abnormality for which there should be one treatment that improves it. And this gives us a problem because we design wonderful studies that get published in excellent journals and frequently produce negative findings. And this is the slight worry on this vicious circle I showed you earlier. This is a lovely study, an important study, showing that progesterone doesn't seem to improve outcomes in recurrent miscarriage. Here's another one, New England Journal, Aspirin plus heparin or aspirin alone in women with recurrent miscarriage doesn't work. The problem of this, of course, is that they have been, women have been randomized who have had a clinical experience, and we don't know what the underlying cause for is. And the risk is that we throw these things in the bin because the New England says they didn't work, when in fact there are patients there, if we made the endometrial diagnosis, whom they would help. So this is going to be crucial for us as we go forward. And if we do, I think we can break up this circle. We can hopefully discern a possible cause. We can inform the patient as a partner. I've had a look, everything seems fine, or this seems to be the problem. Let's try or randomize it to a study with an intervention or try an intervention that is at least theoretically targeted to address the abnormality. And hopefully we can encourage our patients in this slightly more adult discussion, rather than seeing them as desperate patients but patients who are helping us to address what is a difficult issue, part of being a human, you know, it's part of our reproductive failure, that they can hopefully encourage them to get involved with trials. And I think we're more likely then to do RCTs that do have positive findings and hopefully will encourage more funding into our field. So this is a personal, personal view of it, and I'd just like to summarize them with a few conclusions. I think the empirical approach to managing implantation failure, which is still the main approach, and for understandable reasons, as I've admitted at the start, is rooted in desperation, but is failing our patients. The current immune rejection paradigm should be questioned, and I'm putting that very diplomatically. A more reasoned approach starts with an understanding of why implantation failure occurs and what the different roles of the endometrium are in this whole process. Only then, can we start designing tests of endometrial function of these specific functions, which allow therapies to be tested that treat the cause rather than the desperation, which is what they're doing now. I'd just like to finish by acknowledging a number of people who've 
helped with all this work and done a large part of it. At the top, you see members of the Utrecht group, including Jan Brosens, uh, on whom we did the work on the biosensor function. Uh, Southampton, Alex Kermack Francesco on uh, the culture media, if we can call it that. Bonnie Highwell and Ying, who are working on the incubator testing. And the uh, group we have in uh, Copenhagen that's working on implantation in a clinical setting. Thank you very much. <laughs>